Hi there! This is an in-depth trailer breakdown for the pair of House of the Dragon green and black teasers which were just released. Now, same day, I made a quick 7.8 minute long immediate reaction video, light on spoilers. This in-depth version is from the book fan perspective. So there will be some spoilers which I can't avoid, but you knew what you were getting into when you clicked on an in-depth breakdown. At the same time, I'm not going out of my way to give away too much detail. That I want to avoid what clickbait channels do, and you know who they are, where they ramble on for a full page just reading off book spoilers of everyone who dies or plot twists, as if to make up for their lack of real analysis. You know, in Game of Thrones terms, in this video, I'll refer to, in broad strokes, it looks like this is a shot that's in the lead-up to the Red Wedding, but I wouldn't go into heavy detail about what the Red Wedding is. Compared to clickbait channels with the same material would then try to impress you by describing in explicit detail the specific characters who die at the Red Wedding and how they die, naming Rob and Catelyn and all of that. So I'm trying to go light on that, but this is a breakdown. Overall, I will say nothing surprised us in this that we didn't already know about from filming leaks, and it looks like it's pretty book accurate. So there's no giant mysteries this launched, but I want to just narrow down what they're doing here. On top of this, I don't want the breakdown to run a full three hours. I'm trying to focus on new things in these combined teasers, not reused shots from the first teaser. And I know the first teaser came out December 2nd, it was four months ago, but okay, the casual viewers who were not paying attention also say, but we don't want a three hour video. Then maybe you should have watched the other video I already made four months ago, and I'll link it, but guys, if I repeat that information, it makes it longer. You can just watch the link to this, the shots. So occasionally I'll go, oh, this is a shot we already saw from the first teaser. Usually I just skip over those. Mostly I'm making this from a fandom perspective, that the real target audience, I guess, are you know the other channels who I know are watching this. The other mainstream channels then look at my stuff and go, oh, this is what the hardcore breakdown channels are saying, and it filters down from there. But th this is... If you were keeping up to speed with every leak because you're one of my core subscribers, hopefully you'll be up to speed with all of this. That you just people need to pay attention because I don't want to make a three hour thing. Also, the way I'm approaching this, because it was two back to back trailers intercut, I'm not going to do the green and black trailers back to back. And the order I would have done it, it is green and black, because that's the order they came out in, the order I watched them. But even then, like, there's some things, shots from what Rhaenyra's side is doing in the green trailer. There's some shots what the greens are doing in the blacks trailer. It made more sense not to do it back to back, but to stick things together thematically. In roughly what we think the chronology of season two will be, as opposed to what is by timestamp in the teasers. I hope this makes more sense. And the only reason you would do that is to point out when a trailer, I hate it when trailers have misleading cross cuts where they intercut a character giving a reaction shot to an unrelated scene thankfully that didn't come up that much there's like one prominent shot but even other people have noticed like there's a shot where Rainier is at a dinner table with Jason Bela and other people and then it cuts to Damon reacting to her at his right when you see every chair at the table is filled, Daemon isn't there. That's from a different scene. That's from the small council at, at the painted table. That's the only time I need to point that out in case you didn't notice. But a lot of people did. But otherwise, there weren't particularly misleading crosscuts like that. So I'm, there's no reason to go in the order that the teaser presented it. I'm going in what we think the order of the story is. And again, I don't want this to run three hours. I'm already five minutes into this. A few points are important enough that I want to split them off into separate videos, and I'll say that. Sometimes this is just for length, but also because it's a little more speculative. Like, there was enough stuff with Alicent towards the end of the season, or the Dragon Seeds, I'll tell you up front, that there's, I go, 
I acknowledge this shot, but I'm going to break it down more in a separate video because it's a little more speculative. We're not entirely sure what's going on. Though, again, there weren't giant questions raised by these teasers. Oh, oh no, what are they doing? Um, I don't think I've specified this. My nightmare scenario for teaser trailer analysis is, um, and that people believe what they want to believe rather than looking at evidence that I fell victim to this. Back in Game of Thrones Season 5, the initial trailers didn't quite overtly state that we're throwing out Sansa's book story and sending her to Winterfell to take the place of Jane Poole to be raped by Ramsay just for shock value and to bait for awards. But Westeros.org itself noticed from the trailer, why is Sansa standing next to a door that looks like the door style from Winterfell? And because the Sansa rape idea is so absurd, you only think it's not absurd if you, if you if it already happened. That leading up to, if they told us in advance they were doing that, the people would have revolted. I was I kept arguing, no, that can't be true. They must have just been reusing a set for the veil or something because they reuse sets all the time. So I don't want to just tell myself what I want to hear, but that that's the nightmare. That if a trailer hinted at a major change like that, I would acknowledge it. Now, having been burned once, that we have to always be suspicious and be on guard instead of just believing what we want. But thankfully, just telling you up front, there was nothing like that in this trailer, or, or it's so general that no one picked up on it, that we haven't seen anything really unusual even hinted at in these things, which is fine. So that's how I approach doing these, of just we have to be on guard and eternal vigilance. Now, the other big thing I'm doing, I know this makes it a little longer, but it's worth it, and I haven't seen other channels doing this, is that showrunner Ryan Condal gave an accompanying interview in Entertainment Weekly with their nice new uh, Game of Thrones guy, Nick Romano. I liked his reporting in Season 1. He'd even post updates if he accidentally made a mistake. Reporters don't normally do that. He was concerned about being accurate, Nice guy, actually interact with him on Twitter a few times, and he gave he's done really nice reporting, so I'm familiar with him from season one. He gave a new interview with Ryan Connell about these teasers, and it wasn't that detailed, but he did give three or four nice quotes in it about just, this is, you know, Harren Hall's a nice set, or this is uh, working with this new character. So I'm going to quote those off at various points, too, when they're appropriate, no bombshell revelations is just nice context for what they're trying to do here. So now I'm officially eight minutes into this in-depth breakdown of just my attitude towards this, that it's not just... And here, I, I can't stand those so-called breakdowns where it's just... Why are you watching this blind with no spec... You intentionally th didn't read anything and you thought, I can figure this out without context, and... I spent over a year looking at filming leaks to know what's going on, one day at a time. So did the other really hardcore spy channels, like House the Dragon, Wake the Dragon, um, Redanian Intelligence is a big one, who aggregated a lot of it. And it's just, we were paying close attention to this, and when you see people putting in half the effort of, no, we know what's going on, because we were paying really close attention, and you acted like, like that they just let this drop off their radar while, no, there's filming and stuff. People only care when it's the active airing season, but that'll be over soon, and we'll get, this this drought will be over, and we'll get the new season. All that preamble aside, I'm presenting this in story order. Well, one more introduction thing, because it's what the first half of this is. To start with, to get it out of the way, because I think people overhype it, Yes, we are seeing the lead-up to an assassination attempt called the Blood and Cheese Assassination, because the assassins are nicknamed Blood and Cheese. This is a major story point, like I was saying with the Red Wedding thing. I'm not going to go into detail other than to say it's a thing that's an assassination attempt that happens. That the Blacks react to Luke's death by hiring these assassins. After that happens, the Greens... Uh, angrily react by Aegon insisting, I will march to full-scale war now at the head of my army with my dragon, leading to the Battle of Rook's Rest, which in broad terms is the first really big battle of the war. There's one or two earlier battles without dragons. This is the next 
big dragon versus dragon fight, and it's what you mentally pictured all the time you're wondering what was the Dance of the Dragons like, where it's there's multiple dragons in it, and there's two field armies accompanied by dragons, and they're fighting each other. So it's this full-scale battle of armies versus armies, dragons versus dragons. Rook's Rest is just a castle on the coast in the Crown Lands, roughly between King's Landing and Dragonstone, and just the armies end up clashing with each other there. And we know from director schedules and spy photos that we, we saw Alan Taylor in spy photos directing this thing. We know what episodes he does. We know that the Battle of Rook's Rest is episode four, which is mid-season because there's eight episodes this season. The Blood and Cheese assassination, we think they're, they're ending on a cliffhanger that it's starting at the end of episode one, but it'll happen at the very beginning of episode two. And then the aftermath will then continue throughout episode two. That's roughly the outline that we're looking at here. And there's other stuff that's a little fuzzier in the rest of the season. But look, in broad strokes, I'm describing this as what happens. If you already know, I'm sorry I took so much time. If you're a complete newbie to this, I'm trying not to go into too much clickbaity detail. To start with, first thing, the aftermath of Luke's death. I already reported on that in the December teaser, we saw a shot of Rhaenyra looking upset on a beach, which at the time I made a separate video about, I said it confirmed filming leaks we had, we had spy photos of this, that Rhaenyra herself flies to Shipbreaker Bay, the bay around Storm's End, where she will find Luke's corpse. Uh, this teaser just has a much better wide shot of that, that you see that these fishermen must have dra dredged up what's left of him, and that Cyrax or Dragon is there, and you see Rhaenyra walking on the beach to find him, that we knew this, it's just a better shot, and you can see Storm's End in the distance. It's that cylindrical drum tower. This is clearly Shipbreaker Bay. And we've heard rumors of, well, how much of him is left? Is it just his clothes? I've heard one rumor, bits of him or just bits of the dragon. Uh, in the book, this is one of those unreliable narrator moments, because Luke's body was never officially found, but they found the head of his dragon, and they said there's no way he could have survived a fall like that. So they just assume, that, okay, th there was, wasn't anything left to bury. Well, one version says that, one of the salacious versions says that Amon landed and carved his eyes out, but then the other version says his body was never even found, so I think that's hyperbole. But we don't know exactly how they're going to play this. So this isn't quite what the book did, but they have the freedom to do that because the book itself says we're not really sure what happened to his body. That it turns out in secret, Rhaenyra flew there to recover what was left of him, and later on we see his funeral where they're burning what's left of him on a funeral pyre at Dragonstone. So we have that. Right before that, though, I think we see these shots of the dragon keepers in the caverns of Dragonstone rousing Cyrax as Rhaenyra storms off to meet them. That might be, I can't tell the same costume because it's dark, that might be of her marching out to get to Cyrax to then fly to Shipbreaker Base. This might be episode one. It might also be that thing, we know she's also going to fly somewhere in episode eight. Not really sure on that, but I think this is episode one. Then she recovers his body... Um, apparently they do have carved stone holding pens for the dragons on uh, Dragonstone, sort of like smaller versions of the Dragon Pit in King's Landing. The, I always thought they were just caves, but... No, we saw this even with uh, Season 1 finale, when Vermithor was being roused by Daemon, that there is architecture there, that brutalist Valyrian architecture, that there's holding pens for them underground or something. But apparently she takes what's left of him back, and then we have this funeral pyre that we see in wide shot, this Valyrian altar on a mountainside. And in the wide shot, you can clearly see that it's Corlys and Rhaenys are here, opposite the altar, along with Bela and Reyna. That's important because Reyna won't be on Dragonstone later in the season. I've reported before that, as in the book, she goes to the Vale. Uh, as part of their diplomatic thing. So Reyna isn't there at a certain point. You'll see in the dinner scene later, Reyna isn't there that she went to do something. So, okay, this must be pretty early in the season. I'm editing in a quick patch here. 
which I made after I recorded the one-hour script in what was otherwise one take. And this is also what delayed the video a week, that these teasers came out last Friday, and I'm ending up posting the video Easter Sunday of the next weekend. That we got a leak from very reliable sources that Luke's funeral scene is the second-to-last part of episode one. That the scene after that is of Blood and Cheese being hired, and then Blood and Cheese is the beginning of episode two. Which brings up the question of, well, how is Jace back from his journey north so quickly? And I split off a full 20-minute separate video, go and check that out, concluding, well, what we think is going to happen that doesn't really change it too much is that he went to the Eerie, then came back to Dragonstone when word came that Luke died, then will leave to go to Winterfell towards the start of Episode 2, arriving there closer to the end of Episode 2, we think, and maybe Episode 3 is mostly Winterfell stuff. But the rest of the video is me going over travel distances that the Eyrie is pretty close to Dragonstone. It's a, only about as far north of it as Storm's End is south or King's Landing is west, that there's a circle that goes around of the radius of, of dragon travel, that, yeah, that's more or less one day's full flight, that, okay, he doubled back. That doesn't really change things too much, and it gives us the opportunity to have a scene of Rhaenyra maybe telling him about the White Walker prophecy before he actually goes to the Wall. Who knows? But there's a whole separate video on this, but it doesn't really rock the boat that much, and it pretty much worked out in the end, but we really need them to have Winterfell scenes before the end of Episode 2 or people will stop watching. But check out the other video if you want to see more discussion of this in depth. And I like that their costumes look a little more like Daenerys Season 7, that this is what traditional Targaryen clothing looked like. And I, I've talked about this before, that we need Winterfell in Episodes 2 and 3 to keep casual viewers hooked because some people think the blood and cheese assassination is so dark that people would stop watching so you need to go no no we're introducing the prequel starks at that that's what i would do that you that's the timing you should do you shouldn't put the starks up in like episode five or something or episode three you need to get people before that happens or at least within episode two have jace arrive at winterfell so people will keep watching Side note here about the funeral pyre on the mountainside. In season one, the Valyrian altar where Daemon and Rhaenyra get married in episode seven and where Rhaenyra and Daemon burn their stillborn daughter and then she gets crowned in the season one finale, the Valyrian altar. In season one, that was filmed on location in Monsanto, Portugal. They did not go back to Portugal in Season 2, so this must be a digital set. That's entirely reasonable, because in behind-the-scenes things, they said, it was a lot of effort to get to this mountaintop to film these things. There are no roads. We had to get everything there by helicopter. I mean, it's not like it's a big set. So it's mostly just the, the camera uh, gear and the actors, but it's still, they said, logistically, it wasn't worth going back there for the few scenes we're going to do filling on this. So the Portugal fans are a bit upset. Oh, they didn't do, well, they weren't really in Portugal. They were off in a national park. Well, they're, they're reasonably close. They might go back again, I don't know, in another season because they're filming in Caceres, which is like a two-hour drive from there. But this is a digital set. They're, they didn't go back to Portugal. And that's why the altar is actually slightly different from where it was in, in season one, that it used to be in a hillside. Now it's at the top of it. Digital set. Maybe it's a different altar, but whatever. Next shot I'm going to go over is we have our first real shot of Jace in the North. And it's not, I talked about this in my immediate reaction, it's not just he's in the North or at Winterfell, he is atop the wall with the Night's Watch, and this is our first look at Cregan Stark. The only, from behind, a little from the side, we can recognize the actor. And the Entertainment Weekly uh, thing with Condal confirmed, yes, that is Cregan Stark. Didn't say anything about him, though. And this is exciting because we, for a while we were worried, maybe Jace will just go to Winterfell, then Cregan will go to the Wall, but no, he is going to the Wall. I'm interested in, I really, really hope that they show this thing that was in the book Fire and Blood, 
which is a new thing that was published in 2018. It wasn't in the previous novellas, which we think Martin intentionally put in as a reaction to what the TV show did the last year, 2017 in season 7, where Daenerys implausibly flies her dragons within a matter of hours from Blackwater Bay to the Wall in like a single flight, where for Jace, going to Winterfell is a multi-day trip. It takes multiple flights. He has to stop at various points. That when Rhaenyra's great-grandmother, Alysanne, tries to fly her dragon Silverwing beyond the wall, it's like it... It's... She keeps turning around. She refuses to go over the wall. She turns back three times. And it's almost like... She, it's not that she runs into an invisible wall as if she hit this invisible object, but it's like when a, when a dog is on one of those invisible fences where, you know, the electronic shock collar things that something is keeping the dragon from going past the wall. And the running theory is, they do say in the books, the wall is filled with magical spells woven in, into its foundations that prevent magical things from passing it of their own accord. You can take something through, but like, the White Walkers can't pass it, they have to breach it. That turns out dragons can't fly past the wall. And we're really hoping that, like, season one didn't contradict the book, contradict what Game of Thrones did that much, but, um, what if season two really brings up, this is not something that they can do in the books. If you really show Vermax refusing to pass the wall, that will be amazing. And it'll start a lot of discussion of, you really thought that was the real ending? It couldn't be. But anyway, one other thing, though, that I missed in my initial reaction video is because I was only using it cropped to the... It's like a gif that at the end of it, they turn their faces to each other, so I wanted to show the one that wasn't just their hair from behind, but Jace's face. But the camera's moving, that it cropped off his sword, that if you go slightly before that, it is very clear that Cregan is carrying House Stark's ancestral Valyrian steel sword, Ice. The sword that Ned Stark had in Season 1. It's this giant two-handed sword. It's mostly ceremonial for executions and stuff. Some have used it in battle, but it's a big two-hander sword like a claymore. And he's got it strapped along his back, and he's walking along the wall with it. Would he carry it every day, or is it just because it's a formal occasion? He's being a, a state visit by this envoy from one of the two sides in the Civil War. I don't know, but ice is there and we have the wall, and this is going to be a major thing. The thing of people riding around, that was in the first teaser, I talked about that. I don't think that's Jason Cregan, I think that's the Night's Watch, and I hope it's a flashback to them meeting the White Walkers to explain that King Jaehaerys just shut down the first night so they don't have a steady stream of bastard children to sacrifice to them anymore to placate them. And that this is the secret reason why they're really coming back. I've talked about this in other videos for longer of, I really hope we're going to get that as really explaining something Game of Thrones didn't of, well, why are they coming back? Because if you pay attention to the books, it seems it's because Jaehaerys refused to keep placating them with human sacrifices. And it fits the themes of the book about these sacrifice a few for a lot, all of that. But this is just one quick shot, but still one of the most exciting um, other things people have asked about, what other Starks are we going to see? There are really only two Starks in this time period of note. Cregan and his half-sister, his bastard sister, Sarah Snow. We have not heard that Sarah Snow is even in the show. We hope she is. The running theory, just based on cast appearances, is that actress Erica Ford might be playing Sarah Snow just because she looks a lot like Maisie Williams. And we know Erica Ford is in the cast, we just don't know as what. She could be a handmaiden in King's Landing, for all we know. But it, we're pretty hopeful that Sarah Snow is in it. It's just luck of the draw, one of the castings that didn't manage to leak out yet. So, here's hoping. Oh, but the last thing I want to go over that's related to Luke's deaths, this is all stuff from the first episode. We saw the Blacks' reaction to Luke's death, the reaction from the green side. Now, we've heard leaks that, as in the book, Aegon feasts Aemon to, at, at a brothel or something, that, hooray, hooray, you scored a victory there, but that, that's what he does in the books. We've heard they're doing that. We've seen shots of this inn he goes to called the Cox Inn in Flea Bottom or something. But the reaction of Alicent and Otto, which pretty much matches what the books did too, that we have Otto saying in dialogue here that, 
Rhaenyra's faction doesn't care about the good of the realm anymore, only vengeance. And I don't think he's saying that as propaganda, even just to Alicent in private, he's being honest. That before Luke died, he gave them generous surrender terms, that will at Alicent's urging, but he realized from his meeting with, uh, with Rhaenyra on Dragonstone that you could pressure her based on that she w was devoted to the good of the realm. That urging her for the good of the realm, you don't want to plunge it into civil war, just give up, we're going to fight you over this. And she actually said, give me a day to think about it. That he knew he could at least try to leverage her into a diplomatic solution. That Otto is a pragmatist, you know, he's not a, g a great person, but he's not a mustache-twirling villain. He thought he could have, you know, the best victory is the one you get without fighting politics by other means, that it's only after the diplomacy has failed. He thought he could win a bloodless coup, more or less. So it's Otto himself going, now it's war to the knife. This is only going to end when all of the Greens or all of the Blacks are dead. And I also think this is them, their immediate reaction, because if you look at this in motion in the trailer, Alicent is clutching her Faith of the Seven pendant on her necklace with one hand, that she reaches to clutch it. So this is their immediate hearing from Amon that Luke is dead. So that matches pretty well. And here's the direct quote from the book of what their reaction was, that they were not pleased by this. Queen, it says, quote, Queen Alicent went pale when she heard what he had done, crying, Mother, have mercy on us all. Nor was Otto pleased. You only lost one eye, he is reported to have said. How could you be so blind? So that matches the book stuff. That I think that's that moment that's pretty clear. That he wanted to win diplomatically, and no, he didn't want a war. <laughs> that we wanted to win by just getting them to give up. Second major sequence, and this is moving on to episode two, is of course the blood and cheese assassination attempt itself. I already went over that. I'm going to go through this quickly. That that their nicknames. That blood is a gold cloak, and cheese is a rat catcher. That's why they call him cheese. Fans looking at this shot have ID'd the gold cloak in this as being blood. That we know the actor Sam Wilson. This is Sam Wilson. So this is blood. The gold cloak. It's not a different gold cloak. And a hooded figure is offering him a bag of coins. Um, I was wrong in my original reaction video where I said, oh, is this them looking at prisoners? There's a, after blood and cheese, they also execute the black prisoners that they took in the season one finale. But that's later, and that isn't this. That I didn't realize it's a hooded figure handing him a bag of coins through a gate. We can't tell if this is Daemon or Mizaria. Because in the book, it's like Daemon sent a letter to Mizaria and she set it up. Whereas we have reliable reports and script leaks I've seen that Daemon will sneak into King's Landing to meet with Mizaria to then set this up. So this could be Daemon's hand or Mazaria's hand. I actually lean towards Mazaria because the hand looks thinner from this angle at least. Doesn't matter because we know from other sources that Daemon will be in King's Landing. And yes, he could sneak in because he knows all the secret tunnels and stuff. That, that, that's what he does, so I'm fine with that. So this doesn't really give us any new information we didn't already have just yet. Yes, they're setting that up. We knew these reports Daemon personally sneaks in. I don't consider that a big change. Then we get the shots of Blood and Cheese actually sneaking through a, a tunnel, so I'll leave that as it is. And we also got this intriguing shot of a handmaid carrying bloody sheets, which is presumably after the Blood and Cheese assassination attempt, if that's the specific hallway in the Red Keep, I think it is. But moving along, because I don't want to overhype that, when we see that there, there's going to be this funeral held in the immediate aftermath of the Blood and Cheese assassination, which it like happens at the beginning of Episode 2, and then the funeral is also like later in Episode 2. So it's all... At first, I thought it was we thought it was Episode 3, but we got the director's schedule wrong. Both the assassination and the funeral are within the same episode. That the Greens hold this funeral procession to show off this is what Rhaenyra the Cruel has done. And we got a lot of leaks of this because they filmed in the middle of Caceres, Spain ton of spy photos of this, so I'm not going to go into more detail, I've already covered it. Um, there, I will say, there were enough shots of Alicent in this that merit splitting off into a separate video, like I said. So there's going to be a little more speculative 
Allison breakdown video that I'm splitting off from this. One thing we didn't get a clear shot of in the earlier spy photos that we do here is people on, on set said as the funeral procession was going, people were throwing flower petals at them and crying. Now we actually have a shot of that, but we had heard of that. It's the same thing. We already covered this. We got a lot of leaked photos. There's going to be a separate Allison video. Moving along, the third major sequence of events, the Greens' reaction to blood and cheese. We saw a lot of Aegon II in this teaser, really showing off Tom Glyn Carney, which is great. He did a lot with the role despite limited screen time in Season 1. He was only in two episodes of Season 1, and he was still doing a lot with it, put a lot of thought into it. Came to that convention, official convention HBO put together and talked about it on a fan panel. This is my thoughts on it, that he's really his conflicted character. He's, he's not this complete villain like Joffrey was. He's a product of his upbringing. Uh, he's really a pathetic character, not entirely unsympathetic, but you, you see what turned him into. It's all product of his upbringing. I really predict that Tom Glyn Carney is going to be one of the highlight performances of season two, like Emmy consideration level. And given the um, the strong material he has to work with, and that he really impressed me with limited material in season one, and just seeing this that he has to work with, that he's a this flippant brat. He still has people emotions, but he's he's not a Joffrey clone. He's he's different from Joffrey. Another thing is he's not a coward. He's a, this brash kind of bratty guy, but he will go out with his dragon. He wants to go and fight to avenge this. And he will be up in the front. Granted, it's not like, oh, I'm going to fight them on foot. It's like being, well, I'm going to fight them from a battleship. I'm going to fight from a tank. But still, it's dangerous to go, I'm going to ride there and fight with my dragon. Because the other side has dragons or an arrow could shoot you or something. He's not a coward. So they did the right thing by showing him off so prominently in the trailers. And Condal actually talked about this again in the Entertainment Weekly interviews. Broadly, where he said... Well, he's, he's said in prior interviews, season two is, the a big part of season two will be the children of Alicent and the Rhaenyra Daemon side growing into their own. I don't mean, there's no more time skips, they're not growing up. I mean, growing into the person they were going to be, coming into their own, that Jace is going to the north, he has his own storyline out of Rhaenyra's shadow, that... Aegon will be standing up to Otto, that Aemond will be deciding what kind of person he is. He already said that. Here's a new take on it saying the same thing. From Entertainment Weekly, Condal says, The characters that I immediately wanted to get into, that is in the first half of the season, are the characters that we didn't get to spend a lot of time with at the end of season one because of needing to move through 20 years of narrative. We did not get to spend a lot of time with Aegon, Aemon, Helena, Jace, Bela, or Reyna. Those characters are so immediately connected to Rhaenyra, Alicent, Daemon, Viserys, and Otto that we wanted to immediately shine the spotlight on them and get into their internal lives and what they make of all of this war. Their reactions. We never really saw... There was like a deleted scene from the season one finale of Bela reacting to this, which I hope they will reuse almost line for line in episode one. They need to. Sometimes they shuffle scenes like that. Because I don't blame Condal. He said, HBO's international markets put commercials into these things, which severely limits the runtime. The episode 10 was supposed to run long. And HBO only told them, actually, there's a time cap for this, after they had not only scripted it, but after they filmed it. And Connell was like, I understand you need to do that, but you should. the time to tell me this was before we goddamn filmed it. So I don't blame Connell. There, there's a lot of script reports that just came out this week of a lot of other things that were cut from episode 10, not just Bale. I mean, Daemon scenes, Jay scenes, really big things that were cut, which they might recycle into the first episode, we're not sure. But you'll see, he mentions by name, you will see each of these children of the of Rainier and Allison reacting to what happened. And this is all great because, as others have pointed out, a fear we have is we don't want them to make filler for the lead characters rather than branching out into others. That it would dilute their roles. It would dilute Rhaenyra and Alicent that, no, we need Rhaenyra scenes, while at the same time ignoring the secondary characters. And... Game of Thrones really fell into that season five onwards, but even before, where they'd make up filler Tyrion scenes 
and then really reduce the Tyrells and go, well, there, well, you know, there wasn't time. And it's, you're adding scenes that Arya didn't have in the book while at the same time shorting these other major characters. And after season five, it was a joke. I mean, like, Mira Reed literally just disappeared because they were prioritizing... There is no way to hide it. You were prioritizing the people who could plausibly get Emmy nominations. That you were prioritizing them over the... No, it's just these seven people, those core seven, rather than let it branch out. So, on the one hand, you're like, oh, well, they're going to short Rhaenyra. It's... Emma Darcy was only in four episodes last season. They weren't in episode nine. It was a time skip that if... Emma gets four really good episodes out of eight with good scenes of them. That equals season one, which already launched an entire fandom. That there, that you need that mentality of keep it short and sweet. Like other really good Emmy prestige shows, if you make up filler for the leads, it won't be as good and it'll simply dilute it. And it's an ensemble. Like, the, the heart of drama is characters interacting. I'd rather they build up Rhaenyra's son, Jace, so then when she has interactions with him in the back half of the season, it's meteor. So it, it works like that. Or spend time building up Aegon. Like, within the trailer, you see, well, they're building up Aegon in a scene with Alicent. Have scenes of Bela discussing things with Rhaenys or Jace or Rhaenyra. And it works like that. Even Reyna, we know, is getting more to do because she's going to the Vale, so... It sounds like he, this is just so great to hear that Condal wants to keep a good balance on that. And we do have a decent amount of material for Rhaenyra and Alicent, that Rhaenyra is reacting to Luke's death, that in the books after that she doesn't do a lot because she's bereaved. Alicent will have a ton to do reacting to the blood and cheese thing then, so they will have big stuff in the first two episodes. But Condal says a lot of the first half of the season will be expanding the story to their the next generation to their children which is great that's how i would do it praise all around i'm i'm just really happy to hear him saying that and you know it's weird when people kept saying oh how could this run four to five seasons they're saying now when i thought it could only run two to three seasons if you focus purely on the story of radira and allison and short all of the other side characters you could do this in two, three short seasons. But if you really read Fire and Blood and went, wow, uh, what's going on with the battle by the lakeshore? What's Creed and Stark doing? What are the Tullys doing? Uh, the stuff that's happening in The Reach or Joanna Westerling, all these other things that are happening. That The Blackwoods. People who thought it could run three seasons didn't know who the Blackwoods were because I think a lot of people saying that didn't really read the book, but based all of their knowledge on that genuinely nice 20-minute animated featurette on the Dance of the Dragons they put out back in the Season 5 Blu-ray, which was really good, but it's like a 20-minute supercut. If you wanted to tell the story of the War of the Five Kings as a within 20 minutes, imagine this supercut of just Cersei scenes and just Catelyn and Rob scenes, without any of the other stuff and side plots that are going on, and said, oh, you could do that in two seasons. Well, yeah, because this didn't show all the other storylines, that you only picked some of the POVs, not all of them, it's wider than this. So that the, the people saying that are ones, you go, what about the Blackwoods? They'll probably go, Blackwoods who? So that that's a whole separate thing. But yes, this is great. First part of the season, we're going to see a lot of the kids... We see a lot of Aegon in the trailer is the point of all of this, and that's good. Getting back to other reactions to Blood and Cheese, apart from that Aegon insists, let's go to war now, in retaliation for this. Within the trailer, uh, you, you see bits of this. You see the twin brothers, Eric and Eric Cargill, who were both in the Kingsguard, but Eric with an E sided with Rhaenyra and got her father's crown. He's the guy who did that, whereas Arik with an A sided with Aegon. How do you remember the names? Uh, there's a couple of ways. Well, the way I think of it is that Eric sounds like a normal name, like Eric, and he's the good one who sided with Rhaenyra. <laughs> but you, otherwise, like, Arik with an A sided with Aegon. That's how you remember that, whereas Eric with an E, Rhaenyra. 
that's kind of how you do that. So we, we already saw that shot of them fighting in the first teaser that he says, Sir Eric, try to sneak into Dragonstone pretending to be your twin brother, but by pure chance they run into each other in the hallway and then they get into this giant epic duel. And it is literally brother against brother that's going to happen around episode three-ish. That That is definitely coming. They didn't cut that out. And But like one other shot we have in this of just them preparing Ballista on the walls of King's Landing with Arik, the other brother. So that's in there. Long term, of course, their reaction is that because Aegon wants to march the... I'm saying this because it's in the trailer. You can see with your own eyes that, yes, Kristen Cole is very clearly wearing the Hand of the King hand necklace now. So that's not a spoiler. It's spoiled by the by the trailer that, yes, at a certain point, Aegon gets so frustrated with Otto that he says, All right, I'm replacing you as my hand with Kristen Cole, who will then go to war for me. And to war, then. And like I said before, my real hope is they parallel what Game of Thrones did to show this guy isn't Joffrey. By, like, having Otto... This is a pure fan, fan and Have Otto say something like, to Kristen, the king is tired, take him to his bed, like Tywin said to Joffrey, and then have a beat, and then have Aegon turn to Kristen and go, my grandfather is tired, take him to bed, my new hand of the king, and then just have Kristen look at him and go, as you say, your grace. <laughs> Something like that, just to show this guy isn't Joffrey, that the fandom will be expecting he's Joffrey, but he isn't. And just that whole thing of where is power? Where does power lie? If two guys, if Otto and Aegon are telling Kristen, do this, who does he listen to? Well, it depends on the guy that he wants to go and fight. So that's their reaction to that. Keeping with, with this thematic batch of screenshots, the one that did confuse me is that shot of someone rolling a coin down their fingers at the small council table. Uh, keep an eye on I don't think it's anything huge, it's just I can't 100% confirm what it is. I assume this is Aegon. I've seen most people say we think it's Aegon being bored at the small council before he replaces Otto. Uh, because in the first teaser, we also saw him bored and playing with things with his hands. He was playing with those little stone ball things that show they're in session. He's just playing with it. So this is probably him just playing with a coin. Outside chance, it might be Laris, the spy master, because he was a bit, he can be a bit flippant, but I, I doubt it. He could be. But I, I actually saw one thing mistaking this, saying, well, because Laris is the master of coin. No, he's their spy master. Tyland Lannister is the new master of coin. Replacing Beesbury, he was master of ships, now he's master of coin. But Tyland is serious, he's not playful like that. So it's probably Aegon, because we saw him playing with his hands with other things. Maybe Laris. It, it, it doesn't really matter who's doing it. It's not a new character. A uh, few other things here. From the, Then they go to war. They go, we're on the march. We're going to start attacking the Rhaenyra supporters that are on the mainland and the Crown Lands. Which I hope they also bring up that this is securing our food supply because the Crown Lands feed King's Landing. But in the first teaser, we already saw that shot of Kristen Cole executing someone by beheading them. And in this, we see him walking away from that. It's the same battlements, and he's wiping off his sword. That you, you saw in the first teaser, he beheaded Lord Darklin of Duskendale, that they sack Duskendale on their way to Rook's Rest further east. New section. How do the blacks then respond to Aegon's campaign in the Crown Lands, marching through Rosby, Stokeworth, Duskendale, and Rook's Rest? We've seen all of their banners in the army. Well, we get this shot at what appears to be the docks of Driftmark, where Corlys Velaryon is talking with Rhaenyra. I've heard rumors that, for a stretch of episodes at least, what Corlys will be doing is rather than have him out on his boat, where he wouldn't be interacting with characters, they're going to say his fleet is enforcing the blockade, but his personal ship, the Sea Snake, was damaged when he was injured. He was, was damaged, so he's... For a couple of episodes, he's at the docks repairing it so that people can come and visit him and interact with him. That makes sense. It's a way for, as opposed to isolating him on a boat somewhere. So he's at the docks. He's overseeing ship refitting, ship construction for the fleet. You know, you don't need to be personally leading the fleet every time. I think in the book, he was actually on Dragonstone the whole time, commanding his fleet. Like Tywin doesn't personally lead his armies all the time, but he commands his fleet from his castle. But 
Here we have the scene of Corliss talking with Rhaenyra, urging her to go on an all-out offensive to attack Aegon while he's in the field. Or at least I think that's what it is. He's saying, strike off the head. You know, make, make a, a decapitation strike. In the books, Rhaenyra doesn't do that. And I'll leave it as this is one of those unreliable narrator moments. Some say it's because she's inconsolable after Luke died. But others, and this is the way I saw it, is, and I think the TV show is going, is that Rhaenyra realizes Aegon is trying to bait her by attacking her allies on the mainland, that this will not change the course of the war that much. It's her men getting killed. But whereas Aegon is securing foodstuffs, and everything, like this isn't going to change geopolitics that much. It's smarter to wait while the armies of the North and the Vale and the Riverlands gather at Harrenhal that he's trying to bait us out so he can pick our dragons off one-on-one -on -one with Vagar and their other dragons that they want us to rush out. By, you know, and that's a thing, because it's a thing in real life of we're going to bait out the enemy by attacking our allies is a thing. So... Otto, on the other... Actually, on the other side, the Greens, it's the same thing. Otto is the one who said, we have numerical superiority. The Greens control the most populous and richest parts of Westeros, the Westerlands, the Reach. We, it takes time to gather our forces. Do not rush off to war. And Aegon says, no, we'll bait them out right away. So it's on both sides, and this is what drama is. Debating strategy of, do we wait and husband our resources, or do we go for a quick strike now to get them by surprise? So Aegon and Otto disagreed on that, and here's Corlys and Rhaenyra talking about this, and they might be shuffling this around between different characters, I'm not really sure. One key thing, though, and this is like the one thing from the trailer I'm really confused by, other than that, that rolling a coin down your fingers thing won't affect anything, it's somewhat on the small accounts, not a new character. In this shot, you can see that Corlys is wearing the Hand of the Kingpin that he is, he is named in, in the book as Rhaenyra's Hand of the Queen. But that only happens in the book after Rook's Rest. They could have just changed that and done it immediately. But this raises the question, we aren't actually sure when this scene happens. It could be Corlys saying, make a decapitation strike at Aegon while he's at Rook's Rest. And her going, no, they're trying to bait us out. Or it could be after Rook's Rest, when on a more general level Corliss is saying we need to make a complete strike against King's Landing as our army gathers, and Rhaenyra is still, let's gather more people first. So, is this scene before or after Rook's Rest? They could have just changed her making him hand to the Queen earlier. I, I don't know. And in the grand scheme of things, there might be two similar scenes like that, of him going to do that, so... We're not really sure. I don't know. But that is a big question of when does he become Hand of the Queen. That's probably the only big question from the trailer and not really a big one. New Dragons and Dragon Riders is important enough I'm splitting it off into a separate video rather than let this run three hours. But the quick version, I already talked about this in the initial reaction video, is because they have six riderless dragons on the island, and as they pointed this out in the season one finale, you need Valyrian blood to bond with a dragon. Who's going to ride them? They go, well, we're out of legitimate Targaryens. What about illegitimate Targaryens? That they've been living on Dragonstone and Driftmark for a couple hundred years. There's Targaryen bastards or descendants of bastards, like people who look Valyrian but don't know who their grandfather was. And they go, if you think you might have a drop of bastard Targaryen blood in you, try your luck at claiming a dragon. Dozens die. They call it the the. They are called the dragon seeds because they're born of dragon seed. These Targaryen bastards, and they call it the sowing of the dragon seeds. We know from spy photos that saw who was directing it. Lonnie Perister is only directing one episode. We saw that this is happening in episodes six and seven, mostly seven, where they're setting that up. The sowing of the dragon seeds it happens after Rook's rest. But we have this one shot of Rhaenyra feasting the successful dragon seeds, and there's only three of them that you can tell from spy photos. It's uh, Hugh Hammer on the right, at the bottom is Ulf the White, who's his friend, and at the left is Adam of Hull, played by Clinton Liberty. 
And we went through the same shit when we did the first teaser, that when you saw briefly from a low angle, not fully in frame, Adam of Hull, people said, that's Nettles, the fourth Dragon Seed. That isn't Nettles, that's Clinton Liberty. Well, it's because she has black hair in the book, he has silver hair. I think he might dye his hair to hide his parentage. Some Targaryen bastards do that in the novels, where they dye their hair a different color so people won't know they're Targaryens. Maybe. But we've actually had a lot of leaks about him, but I'll leave it at that, that Nettles isn't in this, we think she's in the show, but that she'll show up in the season three premiere, along with Dayron, who I have also made, a, not, not with Dayron, he's in a different part of the continent, but those two characters we think are in it, but in season three, and I'm not worried about that. But I'll leave it at that, that yes... This is pretty much confirming Nettles is not in here. And I've seen clickbaiters saying, this must 100% be Nettles or may a lightning bolt strike me. Well, this is clearly Clinton Liberty. I even, like, posted on his Instagram, this is you, right? And he, and he favored it. Yes, but not just me. Everyone is saying it's him because he was in the, season, the first teaser. And I made a video at the time saying, for God's sake, this is Clinton Liberty, not Nettles. This is Adam of Hull. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna repeat that. I'm just gonna link to it. But I'm gonna make a longer thing about new dragons we saw and the new dragon riders. I'm splitting that off. But this does bring up the issue that we're introducing new characters and splitting off from just the core Targaryen family next season. We got our first clear shot, and this actually is a very clear shot of Alicent's older brother, Gwen, Gwen Hightower. Uh, he was briefly introduced in Season 1, but before the time skips, they just put a helmet on him and had him played by a stuntman rather than waste casting an actor they have to recast to be older anyway. He's played by Freddie Fox. And Condal gave a quote about him, which I thought was interesting in the Entertainment Weekly interview, where he said, Freddie brought so much character and humor to Gwen. The, the, the casting sheet said he's very funny. And is that because we're laughing with him or at him? I'm not sure. But there's character and humor to Gwen who until this season was warded away at Old Town, the, the second city of Westeros, which is in the southwest, it's ruled by the High Towers. Gwen grew up at Old Town in his home base, but now that the High Towers have been put out on the march, not with their army, their main army is still marshalling at Old Town, but he quickly rode, as one person can travel faster than an army, before the roads shut down because of the war, apparently the idea is he, he quickly rode out to King's Landing to support his family's stake in the war. In the book, Gwen was already in King's Landing. It's a little bit of a cheat. Well, why wasn't he there already? Well, I quickly rode here as soon as Viserys died, right before the highways got shut down by the war. Fair enough to have Gwen there interacting with everyone. That, And they do mention in Season 1, Alicent has this brother, Gwen, and Daemon fights him in the tourney. Well, to go back to Condal's thing, Condal explains... The show will continue to be about the extended family. We had plenty of POVs to dig into in, in the interconnected Targaryen universe, but what about the High Towers? How do they fit into all of this? We thought it was very interesting to bring forward this character who was maybe mentioned briefly seen in Season 1, but not really experienced. How does he interact with them? How would that impact Alicent and Otto? And what he would have to say coming in from an outsider who's not been raised at court in King's Landing. And that's a good point, that he, he's really part of the main High Towers. Remember, it's more than Otto's little branch. Otto is the younger brother, and at this point he's not so much Team High Tower as he's Team Small Council. Well, he, he brought, politically he supports the High Towers, but in terms of his persona, his values, he's a creature of the capital. And his immediate family that are there, like Alicent, have been raised to be political like that, but his eldest son, being with their uncle in Old Town for so long, is more of like the High Towers. And my suspicion is, you know, as, as the heartland of chivalry, and, and this is where the Pope is basically still based in this time period, that how Alicent is, is a person of faith, that the High Towers actually are really, like, honorable and fate and, and religious and they're not uncouth that there's things they wouldn't do compared to how ruthless the people in the capital are so i think the humor is probably going to stem from that Gwen is a bit honorable but naive you know like th that humor of when you um you, you put someone uh, this honorable knight in a room with brawn in game of thrones 
and the humor of these this upper class guy who's lived, but and but no, that's what a normal person should say that he doesn't like joking about killing people. My God, you would do that? Well, yeah, of course. He's the straight man to the snarky evil person. So we're going to see more of the high towers now. You saw Otto's older brother Hobart a bit in season one. The last we saw him was at Rhaenyra's marriage to Lenor. And that was like 16 years ago, so in the books, he, he's died in the intervening time skips, just from old age or whatever. So the current ruler of Old Town, the current head of the main branch of the family, the older branch, is Hobart's son, Ormond, who is Otto's nephew. And he has his own children, they have their own issues, that we haven't really seen the High Towers introduced as a faction separate from Otto's little family in in more close to the small council at this point. So introducing them as a group with their own set of values, we haven't seen them yet, and Gwen is going to be like our window into that. You know, like how they briefly introduced Loras in, in Season 1, then gradually rounded out the Tyrells with his sister in Season 2, then the rest of them in Season 3 and his grandmother and everything? That Gwen will be our better window into the main high towers aren't really like them, even though Gwen is his son. He's been living with the main high towers. And then we'll get Ormond and Dayron later, I think. I mean, season three. But they're setting it up. That's all good. That's all good. And going with that theme that they're widening out to show both sides finding allies that we're not, it's not just the Targaryens. We're seeing the other noble houses of Westeros in this prequel era next season. We got a much better shot of the Blackwoods and Brackens squaring off at the beginning of the Battle of the Burning Mill. Condal continues, gave another very good quote. The first season was so much about the royal family that 1% of the upper 1% that rules this world. All the people in the show that had POVs essentially had silver hair. And what I think was missing from season one, not by omission, it was simply because it was, it was not relevant to that specific story, was closely Alice and Rhaenyra. But what was still absent is the more common folk, the small folk of this world, and that brings a certain color and texture. A lot of the fun and the conflict and the humor that came from the original Game of Thrones was thrusting high nobility, this is why I brought up Gwen, thrusting a high nobility like Gwen Hightower into a room with Bronn or the Hound. Or just seeing that the other factions are different. And talking about the Riverlands front of the war, now shifting away from that, this is a whole other section, brings up the shots we had in these teasers of Daemon and his storyline at Harrenhal in the Riverlands. We see a shot of Caraxes landing on top of one of its towers during a thunderstorm. And I've thought on that more since the immediate reaction video. And, I, and I've realized a few things, that the book phrases it as Caraxes alighted atop King's Pyre Tower. The, the highest tower is the King's Pyre because it burned by uh, Beleriion. And then the garrison surrendered without a fight. This is the opening move of the war. Daemon bloodlessly takes Harrenhal. They surrender without a fight. Well, it's after Luke dies. It's after Storm's End, but before the first battle is the Battle of the Burning Mill between the Blackwoods and Brackens. It goes Harrenhal, Burning Mill, then Rook's Rest further east. And while we see a couple of shots related to Harrenhal in this, actually, it, and it's going to be a major recurring location, and it's great because it was all. it's not just recurring throughout House of the Dragon. It'll be a major location throughout the final season, every season. It's also a big returning Game of Thrones location. And uh, Condal himself gave a quote about that, how much fun they had building Harrenhal. They built this fully realized, well, not full, because it's a giant city-sized castle, but they built a very large exterior Harrenhal set at Dinnerwig Quarry in Wales. I have a whole video about the location shoots and the map of Wales where everything is. They built a large exterior for this because it merited it, because they know they're going to use it a lot. Ryan Condal says... Quote, Harrenhal definitely is its own character in the show. It had its own character in the original books, in the original series, when Arya was playing the cupbearer for Tywin there. Other than the Red Keep, it's probably the most talked about storied castle in Westeros. We really wanted to pay service to it. Whether it's real or rumored, it does have this creepy supernatural aura around it that does put people off as this half-burnt ruin. We were excited to play that out as storytellers. And from the location shoots and other interviews, descriptions they've given, 
I like what they said of when you're looking at the shots of this. They said, we put thought into what Harren Hall would look like now, that it was the biggest castle ever built, and they basically, uh, the Ironborn under House Hora, they strip-mined the entire surrounding region to produce enough stone to build this thing. So it looks much like a quarry in Wales, that even though it's not mountainous there, there's like valleys and things made, but it's, a, it's an old mine that they strip-mined everything, and it pretty much devastated the entire surrounding landscape. The, the, all, not just the stone, that they cut down all the wood. The, there used to be forests, they've cut down all the trees. The, the, there's stone slate everywhere, it looks like a, a Welsh mine. But then it got devastated and burned out, about 130 years before this. And then the big point is, nature has reclaimed it since then, because it's barely populated, you could never fully garrison it, large parts of the castle are in ruin, and large parts are just abandoned. So they said it looks like not just a mine in Wales, but an abandoned slate mine in Wales that has been reclaimed by nature. You know, those interesting shots of like what Pripyat and Chernobyl look like today, where, where modern ruins where nature has regrown through through stuff they showed a bit of that in game of thrones where they show that there's trees growing in parts of it that they didn't cut down but when you see the landscape shots and what they did with it this is just a lot of thought went into that harren hall is this blasted landscape that was then regrown and what would that look like exactly with this half ruined castle well anyway I, I put time on that, because it's going to be a major location. A lot of the show is going to take place there. More than Game of Thrones, probably. Well, I said in my first reaction video, hey, it's Harrenhal, but... Here's the thing I realized going over this. That discrepancy of, in the book... Like, in broad daylight, he lands on top of the highest tower to scare everyone into surrendering. In this, it looks like he comes under cover of night and under the further cover of a thunderstorm. Why would you do that if your intention was, it was to get everyone's attention? To go, hey, I'm here. And when you put that in context of there's other shots of him sneaking around in what looks like the halls of Harren Hall in full armor with his helmet on. And that's another th key thing that George R. R. Martin always talks about. People never wear their helmets that... They're hesitant to have people wear helmets in this show unless they're really f ready to fight someone. So this isn't just him stalking holes. He has his sword drawn, helmet on. What I think they're doing is that he lands on the highest tower but doesn't have Caraxes roar to announce himself. He dismounts, sneaks down through the castle, and then finds the castle and... Or flat out bursts in while they're all eating dinner and says, Hey, I'm here with a sword, and on top of that I have a dragon right behind me, uh, up on top of the roof. Surrender, and they do. Just for fun. It would be funny. That's what I think all these sneaking shots are of. Because if you notice, like, I thought that when you see the shot of Caraxes on top of the tower, it's hard to see. I thought the soldiers were running away. But now it looks like they're not even paying attention to Caraxes because they're not looking up. They don't see him. So then, after they surrender, Caraxes triumphantly roars during the thunderstorm or something. That's what I think they're doing. This is an invention not in the books, but fine. It just emphasizes he took them by complete surprise because he's cunning. Fair enough. Oh, the other news is, and we were surprised by how much they're expanding Harren Hall. The castellan of Harrenhal in the books is Simon Strong, who is Laris's great-uncle. That is, he's Lionel's uncle from the younger branch of the family. And the idea is that Larry, is, Larry Strong is the lord of Harrenhal because it belongs to House Strong, but he's in King's Landing all the time, so the day-to-day -day guy in charge of the castellan is old great-uncle Simon. And they cast a very prominent veteran uh, British actor, theater actor, stage actor, Simon Russell Beale, to play Simon Strong. And I mean, like, this is, when you list off the short list of the five people considered the greatest living theater actors in Britain, he is on that five-person list. Simon Russell Beale, done a lot of Shakespeare, very prominent actor, and you cast him as this relatively minor character in this. I think they're really expanding that, just because he... It, it's not a problem. It's, well, he's a character who interacts with Daemon. 
Damon has to have someone to talk to. So, okay. So that you'd see Simon Russell Beale in these scenes, that he'd be the one surrendering to Damon. But okay, they're playing it up that he takes he sneaks in and takes them by surprise. Or in the book, it's they go, oh crap, at the mere sight of him. I, I do think there'll be this oh crap moment when they look up and go, oh god, Caraxes is already on top of us. Few dragons can inspire that much dread. Other ones you at least like try to snipe at the at the rider with an with bows and arrows. When Vagar and Caraxes are the lead ones, that if you see Vagar, you run away. When you see Caraxes, enemy armies just run away. Like the crab feeder that, screw it, we'll, we'll get them with guerrilla tactics, do not face this thing head on. Uh, there's two other shots that I wasn't entirely sure on, though, related to this. That we see a knight looking out a window. It, darkness of, it's, it's it, nighttime. And he sees a dragon flying through the window. Now, I can't tell if this is one of the window slits on Dragonstone or Harrenhal, because it's dark. I've tried looking at comparison shots. Some people said this guy is in Kingsguard armor. Others said not. So either this is someone seeing a dragon, a Kingsguard seeing a dragon leaving Dragonstone, or this is a knight seeing Caraxes slipping in on top of the castle before anyone can notice. At, at Harrenhal, so it's one or the other, not a giant revelation either way, I don't know. And the other shot is there's a point where you see Daemon walking around in his night clothes, not in his armor. And that could be from anything. Is this from Dragonstone? More probably, I think this is from when he is, we saw that leaked audition tape where he like takes a minor wound, which is being patched up by Alice Rivers the resident healer at Harrenhal, who's allegedly this bastard daughter of House Strong. So that might be then, that logically he'd take his armor off to be treated, or maybe he's gl she's glamouring him or something, that he sees things in the hallways that aren't there. I'm not going to take that, I've seen no evidence of that. So maybe he'll be seeing things because of Alice, but we have no suggestion of that. I think it's just him wandering around, going, oh, Alice, you're here. Whatever. But then quite separately from that, that this couldn't, when the part where Daemon is giving surrender terms, that big point in the trailer where he goes, our terms are simple. Bend the knee, reject the false king, swear to the queen, or your house burns. That happens in the middle of the day. You can see how brightly lit it is. That isn't at Harrenhal. That is more probably part of the burning mill scene. Because he is in that battle at the end of it in the book. That it's the Blackwoods and Brackens fight each other at the Battle of the Burning Mill... The Bracken army withdraws back to their castle Stonehenge, only to realize that the skeleton garrison they left behind surrendered to Daemon when he showed up with Caraxes, cutting off their retreat. So they most they surrender without a, a. He took the castle immediately. That they could have held out in the castle as a siege for a while, but he took it while their army was away. Some people see those as two events in, in wiki terms. I see that as the Battle of the Burning Mill as including the fall of Stonehenge, whatever point is, I, th I think it's pretty clearly that Daemon shows up at the end of the battle, the Burning Mill, with the Blackwoods and Brackens, and asks for their surrender then. This is after Harrenhal. Fair enough, that's probably part of that. Nothing really weird different from the books yet, or like playing up that he took Harrenhal by surprise by sneaking in under a thunderstorm. That's fun, it doesn't really alter anything. And the last shot here, which is chronologically probably much later... Is and I already pointed this out. This is this was in the first teaser. We saw this army camp. We didn't know what it was. We now have the wider shot that this is Daemon surveying his gathering armies at Harrenhal, and he said in the season one finale, "We're going to use it as a rallying point for all the houses that side with us. Armies from the Riverlands, Northerner Stark armies show show up the Vale. That this is their main rallying point." And we've seen the leaks from, this might not be episode 7, he might have more than one scene surveying his growing army. But episode 7, he'll be surveying, we had this leak that he's looking out over his army camps and naming all the Riverlands vassals like um, the Blackwoods, the Vances, when the Tullys come to treat with him. That he's not going to go to River Run, you know, for cost effectiveness, they'll have, the Tullys will send one of their sons to Harrenhal to say, our family is internally divided about which side to support. My great-grandfather is on his deathbed. He's an ardent Green supporter. And the rest of us were ignoring his commands by staying neutral. And he's like, well, 
then just side with us. But look, we family duty honor is the Tully Code, and we don't want to outright disobey our grandfather by siding with the blacks. We're just going to be neutral until he dies. The man is dying on his deathbed. We will come, but it'll take some time. The Tullys are mostly in the late stage of the war after the others are exhausted, that they come in to give them new strength. But we know that scene with the, this Tully knight uh, will be coming in episode 7 with the army camps. And we were why is there a valley around Harrenhal? Well, there's plains. Well, they said they're, they're mines, that these are not natural valleys. They're carved out from where they quarried all the stone to build Harrenhal, which makes sense. And we know also from real life that this is the, the um, skyline of Dinnerway Quarry, where they filmed this. We can recognize it, it's the slate quarry in Wales. As I said, I'm already a little over an hour on this. I don't want the whole thing to run a full three hours, and I wanted to split off some of the more speculative videos. There's about five of these. I have one on what is Allison doing, but there's Allison. It's about three pages of notes. Then New Dragons and Riders. I haven't been able to go over that yet. Then another shorter one on... Dayron isn't in Season 2, but we think they'll start mentioning him, that Gwen will mention what happened to him, that he'll be in Season 3. A short one on the Isle of Faces, which we briefly saw in one shot. And then, to keep it short and to the point, a video on the end point of Season 2, because it's brought up by these screenshots, and people keep asking. After that, I will work on the giant outline, episode-by-episode episode outline of Season 2 which I was waiting to see the teasers. The teasers didn't fundamentally alter that. We have had an accurate outline episode by episode of season two since last September because we were following the filming news on a daily basis. But I already have this written up. I have it on forums and stuff outline. It's just making a presentation of it at good quality will take a little longer because I made people wait this long. I might as well make a good version. So please like and subscribe and follow me after the jump. I said I'm splitting off like half a dozen videos from this on specific points because they're a little more speculative.